Did you know that mathematically, half-assing three things is equivalent to one and a half-assing one thing? It's time for the second installment of Potpourri, the videos where I cover multiple topics that I don't have an entire opinion on. Our first topic, Mass Effect Andromeda. The new Mass Effect game is scheduled to release in the first half of 2017. Scuttlebutt says it'll be March 21st, which you can take with as many grains of salt as you like. We've now seen a work-in-progress gameplay video and heard a few tidbits about the story, but we still haven't heard much. But never let it be said that I let lack of information stop me from forming an angry opinion. It's looking more and more like the story framework for the game that was leaked a while back is going to be accurate. In case you're not familiar with it, I'll bring you up to speed. Towards the end of the third game, there's a conversation with the Asari counselor where she says this. Then you'll excuse me. There are preparations to make continuity of civilization to consider. I never thought this day would come. The speculation is that she was referring to some kind of arc, a giant spaceship onto which the various species of our galaxy would be loaded and fired at the next galaxy over. Owing to the immense distance, those on the ship would have no way of knowing what had happened after their departure, thereby sidestepping the ending choice, and their new task would be to find a new home or homes for the races on board, and ensure the continuity of civilization that the Counselor was talking about. And that's good. That's really good. No, seriously. That's a potentially dynamite campaign hook you have there. Presumably the new galaxy will be inhabited. Some of the locals might view their new neighbors with suspicion, while others might see an opportunity in collaborating with them. The characters could find themselves dragged into regional politics. What's more, as supplies run out, finding places to settle would quickly become a matter of survival. As things get more and more desperate, I could see aggressive and diplomatic factions forming on the Ark itself, each trying to convince the moderates and all of the above wheeling and dealing with various groups of natives. I mean, goddamn, this game practically writes itself. There are a ton of potential storylines here, so why am I worried? Well, if Dick Cheney and Batman have taught me anything, it's that if there's even a 1% chance a game is going to suck, we have to treat it as an absolute certainty. What I'm worried about is the other storyline. If you've followed the game's development, you may already know the one I'm talking about. The one where the galaxy of Andromeda has some kind of ancient secret. Some evil that's been slumbering for 5,000 years or whatever, and either is or is opposed by something called the Remnant. Hey, at least it didn't start with a C this time. The reason I worry about this is because it's part of a pattern I've noticed in modern Bioware. That is to say, post-Mass Effect 2 Bioware. That pattern is that, generally speaking, the main quest is the weakest part of the story. Bioware's side content is typically full of imagination and memorable characters, and usually supplies the elements that resonate most with the fandom. The main stories, by contrast, lack the same spark. They tend towards the formulaic and are too often plagued by head-scratching logical problems. Exactly why this is could be the subject of its own video. Personally, I blame Damon Lindelof, but I'll stick to practical advice here. Andromeda's basic campaign hook, that of an arc full of not-always-friendly races trying to find a new home in a new galaxy? That's enough. There's a game's worth of potential content there. Maybe several games worth, you don't need anything else. You don't need the ancient, mysterious what's-it or whatever it is you're planning. I know Bioware is gonna put this thing with the Remnant in. I just hope it doesn't take over the proceedings at the expense of the campaign hook, because the campaign hook, as I understand it, is strong enough to stand on its own. Our second topic? CD Projekt Red. CD Projekt Red is the earthly personification of God's divine love. They release quality games with substantial post-launch support, without DRM or microtransactions, and they treat their customers with respect. When they're not changing the industry for the better, their employees spend their free time frolicking with woodland creatures and nursing injured field mice back to health. All kidding aside, they are quite an impressive developer, and by now, widely admired as well. In fact, in the last year or two, they may have replaced Valve in the minds of gamers as the developer that other developers should try to be like. Partly because they actually release things other than hats! CD Projekt deserves credit for the many things they do right. However, the downside of doing things right is that it encourages me to hold you to an ever more unreasonable standard. And based on what I've seen and heard and read, it appears that in one particular area, that of a culture that permits long periods of so-called crunch, CD Projekt is very much like other developers. If you're not familiar with the term, crunch refers to the practice of making employees work extra long hours in extra stressful situations in the months leading up to a game's release. It's pretty much standard practice across the industry, which is not a particularly good excuse for its existence. The reality of deadlines and release dates means that a certain amount of crunch is to be expected. 
But indications all across the world of game development are that the culture of crunch has gone way past the reasonable, and the personal lives of Joe Artist and Jane Coder have paid the price. This is why I'm not entirely comfortable holding up CD Projekt Red as a model of ethical game development. Because to me, ethical game development means not only treating your customers well, but also your employees. This is especially true in CDPR's case. I can't be the only person who noticed the extraordinary value we got in The Witcher 3. It had the scope of a giant open-world sprawler and the polish and care of a much shorter game. That's not supposed to be possible. Good management probably accounts for part of that. But I can't help but suspect that the other part is that wages in Poland are lower than they are in the countries where AAA developers usually set up shop. Now, I'm not saying that CD Projekt is obligated to personally end crunch culture, or personally correct for a wage disparity between two entire economies. But we should recognize the potential downside of focusing our standards for ethical game development solely on the treatment of customers. Balancing the treatment of customers and employees isn't a zero-sum game, but there is a trade-off there. And I can tell you that I personally would be willing to pay a little more, or wait a little longer, or get a little bit less game if it meant that I knew management wasn't cracking the whip so hard come crunch time. I feel like I got excellent value from The Witcher 3. I also know that there's no such thing as a free lunch. And if I didn't pay for this particular lunch, someone else must have. I just hope it wasn't CDPR's employees, and, if so, I hope it wasn't too expensive. Don't get me wrong, I still like CD Projekt as a developer. But, as always, we as consumers have the opportunity to use our powers of complaining for good. For the sake of the people who make the games we enjoy so much, we should take it. I'm doing my part! I'm doing my part! I'm doing my part! I'm doing my part, too! <laughs> They're doing their part. Are you? And now the time has come for me to be late to yet another party and talk about No Man's Sky. After all, I can't let a perfectly good shitstorm go uncommented on. As I played the game and saw the backlash, I couldn't help noticing that it all seemed so familiar. I myself was born like Venus from the foam of the whole Mass Effect 3 ending brouhaha, so I know from consumer belly aching. One thing in particular brought me back to the heady days of my youth, by which I mean March of 2012. You may not remember, but during one of the darkest hours of the Dark Night of the Soul that was the ending controversy, someone actually filed a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission, essentially saying that EA hadn't delivered what their advertising had promised. I remember thinking at the time that that was a bit much. Even those of us who didn't like the ending either harumphed their disapproval or privately thought that it made us look silly. But even then, my objections were to the merits of that particular instance, not the concept of legal recourse itself. Consumer protection laws exist for a reason. They didn't come from nowhere, they arose as a way to manage disputes not dissimilar to the ones gaming has today. The usual routine for consumer grievance in gaming thus far has been to pit stonewalling and spin on one side against hooting and hollering on the other with the victory going to whoever has more stamina. But it doesn't have to be that way. Too often we're told that video games are for kids and that we shouldn't try to sit at the grown-up table. And not to prematurely trigger any midlife crises, but this little hobby of ours now clocks the revenue of a fully grown adult industry. We shouldn't be so quick to flinch away from legal recourse against deceptive practices, or have embarrassment be our first reaction. Which brings me back to No Man's Sky, and the thing about it that reminded me of Mass Effect 3. Which is that the UK's Advertising Standards Agency has launched an investigation into Hello Games' marketing to determine whether or not it was misleading. And this time, I think the chortling was not quite so loud or widespread as it was four and a half years ago. Note that the quality of either game is not really the point here. Do I think that No Man's Sky is good? Bad? Average? I'm not telling. You're just gonna have to wonder, because this is bigger than any one release, no matter how hyped it was. Misleading marketing practices are rampant in this business, not just in Steam shovelware or the occasional high-profile flop, but all the way up to the world of AAA development. The infamous bullshot is practically an industry standard at this point. Invoking the fearsome FTC and its dread legions should not be an option we reserve only for when the seesaw between hype and disappointment reaches critical mass. Doing so devalues consumer complaints by muddying them up with toxic behavior on one side and repetitive arguments about gamer entitlement on the other. What I would like is for some standard of honesty to be upheld in game marketing, a standard that's been decoupled from loyalty to games we like and vendettas against games we don't and a standard with a bit more level-headedness and sense of perspective than you expect from your typical internet backlash. I wonder if the government might not be the best option to uphold that standard, just as it's sometimes been upheld in other industries. 
There are hundreds of billions of dollars changing hands here. It's not unreasonable to expect a bit of oversight. The bullshot gravy train should have been over years and years ago. And if we as consumers don't make use of all the tools available to us, I expect it'll be with us for years and years to come.